In this series, I'm building a digital clock on the way to building an 8-bit computer. Now, one of the core capabilities a clock must have is the ability to count up. In this and the next couple of videos, I'm going to look at how we can build a digital counter using some very simple technology. In the last video, we looked at the buffer, the NOT gate, the AND gate, and the OR gate. We use physical switches to implement these, which require my hand to physically move the switch. But what if I want to feed the output of one gate into the input of another gate? Say I want to make a three input AND gate using two two input AND gates. Using these switches, how do we get the output of one gate to control the position of the switch on another gate? Let's simplify it even further. I have two buffers and I want to connect the output of one buffer into the input of a second buffer. When the input to the left buffer is on, its output will be on. This feeds to the input of the second buffer on the right and its output will be on also. When the input to the left buffer is off, its output will be off and the output of the right buffer will be off as well. Can we implement this with switches? Well, yes, but it's kind of messy. I have to set the first switch, then I look at the first globe, then I use this information to set the second switch. But the problem is that I'm in the loop. What if I want to do this dozens or even hundreds of times per second? I can't do it. But there are other types of switches I can use, and one of them is this little device called a relay. It's a switch, but instead of using my hand to set the position of the switch, we use an electromagnet. Relays were born out of the need for electronic communication, which was much faster than physical communication. In the early parts of the 19th century, this was particularly important for the newly invented railway system. When you have a single track, but trains going in both directions, it's pretty important to be able to communicate between the stations. One of the first long-distance electronic communication systems was Samuel Morse's telegraph. He had an encoding system where each letter of the alphabet and the numbers could be coded as a series of dots and dashes, and this was used for over 100 years. The problem with the telegraph was that the electrical properties of the wire meant that in the early systems, the signals could only travel a couple of hundred metres from the transmitter to the receiver. Introducing the relay. It's based on the idea that when you pass electricity through a coil of wire, it becomes a temporary magnet. This magnet moves the armature and opens and closes the contacts on a new switch. So what they did was retransmit or relay the signal every couple of hundred metres and straight away they were able to extend the signal to about 10 miles or 16 kilometres. It's as though the information from the operator has been passed from one circuit to the next, like a baton being passed from one runner to the next in a relay race. While Morse was the first to receive a pattern for the relay, it was actually American scientist Joseph Henry who appears to have invented it. This is the diagram for the relay with the electromagnet on the left and the switch on the right. Two of the connections go directly to the magnet, while the switch has a common position, an on position and an off position. When no electricity is applied to the electromagnet, the common input of the switch is electrically connected to the off position, but when the electromagnet's energised, that is, it has electricity applied, then the common input's connected to the on position. This particular relay actually contains two switches, but we won't worry about that for now. Here, I've connected up a single relay as a buffer, so the globe is connected to the on position of the relay switch. At rest, with no power to the coil, the common inputs connect to the off position. When I apply power to the coil, it energizes the magnet, which flips the switch, and moves the armature of the switch to the on position. Now, I've connected the light bulb up to the on position, so electricity flows to it, and we get light. Next, I can connect up a second relay, which is also configured as a buffer. When there's no electrical input on the left, the switch will be in the off position, and no electricity will flow to the second electromagnet, and it will be off as well. If I apply electricity to the input on the left relay, it turns on. Electricity flows to the on output. This in turn energizes the electromagnet in the second relay. This flips the second switch to the on position. 
This allows electricity to flow to the second output, which is connected to our light bulb. I can make this chain as long as I want. The single most important point I want to make here is that I can use the output of one gate to control the switch position of another gate. In fact, this is the basic idea behind the telegraph, except each local loop has its own battery or power source. When we tap the key, we energize the first relay. This turns its switch on. Then the second battery energizes the second relay. This turns on and energizes the third relay coil. Finally, this turns on and illuminates the lamp or sounds a buzzer. Now, it turns out we can implement all of the gates we've seen so far with relays. First is the buffer. When the switch is on, it energizes the magnet in the relay. This moves the armature and flips the relay switch to the on position. Next, the inverter. This time, the globe is connected to the off position of the relay switch. At rest, when no electricity is applied to the relay coil, the relay switch will be in the off position. But the globe is connected to the off position, so we actually have a closed circuit with the globe, and it will emit light. When we do apply electricity to the relay coil, it energizes the magnet, and this flips the switch to the on position. But this actually cuts off the electricity flow to the globe, and it turns off. So far, so good. What about this circuit? When the A and B inputs are off, both switches are in the off position and no electricity flows to the light. If A is on, it turns on the switch in the first relay, but the switch in the second relay is still off, so no electricity gets to the globe. When A and B are on, both relay switches are in the on position, electricity does get to the globe and it emits light. We have an AND gate. Here, I've built one. Note that the output remains off until the inputs to both relays are on. Now, in this configuration, if both A and B are off, there's no electricity to the globe. But if A is on, or if B is on, or both are on, then we have a closed circuit with the globe, and it turns on. This is an OR gate. I've reconfigured the wires to be an OR gate, and now we only need one relay to be on for the light to be on. You might be wondering why I've introduced relays when ultimately we're going to be using transistors and silicon chips. Well, I remember back in the day, I had a Tandy 150-in-1 electronics kit. Tandy was the Australian subsidiary of Radio Shack in the US. I clearly remember understanding how relays and light globes worked when I was quite young, maybe 9 or 10. I understood these many years before I really understood how transistors and silicon chips work. At this stage, I want to keep the electronics as simple as possible because it's the principles of digital logic and gates that I want you to focus on for now. Well, that's it for this video. In the next one, we'll look at how we can form a computer's memory with relays. Just a final thought. How far can we get towards building an actual computer with relays? Well, German inventor Konrad Zuse built a machine called the Z3 out of relays in 1941 that is thought to be the first fully programmable computer. More recently, Professor Harry Porter from Portland State University built a relay-based computer in his office.